Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. It is June the 17th and we're on Proverbs 25. I'm back with my brother today, Raymond Mazel, and um, we're going to look at um, some of the verses. So this is kind of an assorted Proverbs of Solomon. I, all of these are really assorted Proverbs, uh, depending on who wrote them, but these are attributed to Solomon. And it says, these are are more Proverbs of Solomon collected by the advisors of King Hezekiah of Judah. So it says Solomon wrote them, but somebody else put them together. So this wasn't his compilation. It says, it is God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. No one can comprehend the height of heaven, the depth of earth, or all that goes on in the king's mind. Remove the impurities from silver and the sterling will be ready for the silversmith. Remove the wicked from the king's court and his reign will be made secure by justice. So let's start with verses two and three. It says, it's God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. Why do you think God conceals things from us? And as he does, how do we seek for them? Um, I, I suppose that one of the reasons they are concealed is um, if everything was laid open, those who were wise and those who were foolish would have equal access to that. Um, and and um, sometimes knowledge in the hands of a fool can be a very dangerous thing, you know. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that by some things being concealed, it shows our efforts, um, our patience. And I think patience and wisdom go hand in hand many times. But I, I think it shows our, our uh, desire to learn, to strive for, uh, to grow. Um, and, and I think that's good for us, you know, I, just like growing up that there, there are some things that, um, the resistance of me growing to learn is something that's good for me, not only the knowledge that I receive, but, but the resistance and the effort and the work that it takes, uh, to accomplish that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we as humans, um, want, a sense of purpose and, and, and drive. And so I, I think that um, in us endeavoring to learn those, some of those things that he has concealed is, is one of those things that shows our wisdom and our drive and our purpose to grow in him, you know. Yeah. So verse four and five kind of go together. It says, remove the impurities from silver and the sterling will be ready for the silversmith. Remove the wicked from the king's court and his reign will be made secure by justice. So it, it compares impurities of silver to wickedness inside of the court of the king. Um, all of us as leaders, you as a pastor, me as a pastor, a business owner, you know, just in every area of leadership, we have inner circles of people. Why is integrity so important in your inner circle? Hmm. Um, you know, on, on this verse, on verse four, you know, it, it gives a good insight into that itself. You know, it says, um, it says when the impurities are removed from the silver, uh, it's made ready for the silversmith. The implication there is so that the silversmith can then take it and shape it. Um, and, and so the implication is until, until the impurities are out, until there's integrity in, in that inner circle, it becomes, uh, exponentially more difficult to shape it and for there to be quality strength in it you know until those impurities are out of that silver not only is it more difficult to shape the way you need but but the the metal is is not as good a quality metal when it gets to the finished product um and so you know if if i were to if i were to give advice to a, a younger minister um, walking into ministry or into a church, um, I would probably lean on that understanding that passage um, and, and telling them before you try to build a whole lot, you know, you need you need to find out who's who's with you and who's not, who's of integrity and who's not, um, because it, it, in in verse five it says, "Remove the wicked from the king's court, and his reign shall be made secure by justice." Uh, what I find is that as long as those, as long as those impurities are there in that inner circle, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter matter how good your decisions are. There's always going to be a negative undercurrent 
to everything you do. Um, and, and so as a leader, I would say one of the first orders of business, and I don't think you can come in and just clear house. <laughs> I'm not saying yeah. I think you have to take your time. I think you have to be patient. I think you have to look for the right timing on things. And but it's I, not always immediately um, obvious who has integrity and who doesn't. That's right. It, it takes time, yes. It, it takes time to do that, to figure that out. But I think that's one of the I think that's one of the top priorities that you should have as a leader. Um, because you know the organization is going to be weaker, it's going to suffer, it's going to struggle uh, as long as there um, as long as there's a lack of integrity in that group. So verse six and seven says, "Don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head table than to be sent away in public disgrace just because you've seen something. Um, don't be in a hurry to go to court." For what will you do in the end if your neighbor deals you a shameful defeat? But I mainly want to talk about verses 6 and 7. He says, don't demand an audience with the king or push your way. It's better to wait. Right. Why, why is it so difficult to wait for our opportunity? Oh, um, because we have a tendency to, to uh, well, we're impatient by nature, most of us, you know. We have a tendency to run ahead of God to figure things out, what we feel like is the answer. Um, and then we struggle with wanting it to happen that day the way we want it to happen. And, and that's tough. It's tough to it's tough to feel like you know the answer and and to have to shut up and sit on it. Mm -hmm. you know um, a lot of times we we think we know how the king needs to decide. and all we need to do is if we can get in a room and tell him how to decide, mm -hmm. Then, then you know, we'll solve the problem for it. Or even when we do tell him, he don't want to listen. You know, that's right. his own idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think what I see in that is that the opportunity is what's. Um, I guess this is the best way to say it. The opportunity is what's um, key, mm -hmm. not the answer. Um, because even if you have the right answer, but you shut your opportunity down, your your right answer does no good. Right. You know, and, and so the opportunity, it's, it's vital that you keep that opportunity there. Yeah. And if you jump ahead of it before the time is right, um, if you're not patient and you're not wise and you don't wait for that opportunity to come fully to its own, then, then what you're going to do is even if you have a good idea, even if you have the right answer, you're going to ruin that opportunity. And the opportunity is the pathway. That's the door, not, not the right answer. You know, sometimes... I'm hesitant to say this, but sometimes in a business or in a church, a secondary idea or a secondary um, answer is what's won the day. Mm -hmm. Not because it was the best answer, but because it had the right timing on it right. attached to it. Yeah. So verse 8 through 10 says, Don't be in a hurry to go to court. For what will you do in the end if your neighbor deals you a shameful defeat? When arguing with your neighbor, don't betray another person's secret. Others may accuse you of gossip, and you will never regain your good reputation. Um, it begins by saying, don't be in a hurry to go to court. And then it talks about this tension between neighbors, gossip, um, uh, arguing, betraying another person's secret. Why do you think we are obligated to try to work things out with our neighbor? Hmm. Um, I, I guess it, it probably goes back to what we were talking about earlier on, on that, that common good, um, you know, being, having a willingness to prefer our brothers, to care about our brothers, uh, to want to do what is best for a larger audience other than just ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, but to truly be a, a friendly person. Um, and model the behavior and love of Christ, you know. Um, you know, I, I think that the encouragement is to go back to that. W one of the things that, that um, here's one of the things I think would probably be good to, to state maybe, is that the Proverbs aren't promises. You know, they, they're, the, the way I see them is that, that Proverbs are, are sayings based on um, 
wisdom that's kind of woven into the universe. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, Proverbs aren't necessarily something that is for the righteous or the redeemed. And the Proverbs weren't exclusive to the Jewish people. We see that in chapters 30 and 31 because what seemingly seems to be Gentile named men, you know, are part of that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of the Bible that it, are promises to the redeemed. You know, that if you do this, I promise this. You know, if you follow me here, I promise to do this. What I see in the Proverbs is m more like natural laws. You know, there are laws of nature, there are laws of physics that are woven in this universe and they apply to anybody. Um, they're not exclusive 100% of the time, but you know, it's kind of like the laws of physics of jumping out of an airplane. You know, you jump out of an airplane without a parachute, chances are you're not gonna make it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, that's not a promise you're not gonna make it. Right. Some people have survived it, you know, but, but the, the laws of physics say, right. you know, you got a much better chance if you follow these principles and you pathways. Stay in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> stay, uh, or on the ground <laughs> altogether, right? Um, but but I, I guess what I see in, in in these in these proverbs here is just advice that there's also this moral code that's, that's kind of woven into the universe that if you follow these actions and these attitudes of of being patient and seeking knowledge and not being quick to uh, accuse or spout off at the mouth or you know, but if you'll wait for the right time and, and if you'll think about your neighbor um, and not just what is good for you, um, then, then a non-religious person would have a tendency that, to label that almost like karma. Mm -hmm. You know, that chances are karma is going to be good to you. Well, I don't necessarily believe in karma, but what Proverbs are listing here is more or less that, that God has woven in this universe these laws, these moral laws. And if you follow these that are wise, you're, you're probably going to end up with a good result. And if you follow these that are foolish, you're probably going to end up with a bad result. And, and so I think it's important that we care about our neighbors. I think it's important that we uh, are patient in, in whatever we're pursuing, uh, whether it's going to court or going before the king. Um, or dealing with our neighbor uh, on things that we are dissatisfied about. I, I just think that that if we act in haste, haste has a tendency to um, bring bad outcomes quick more often than than patience does. Right. You know. Um, verses eighteen and nineteen says, "Telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an axe, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with an arrow." Putting confidence in an unreliable person in times of trouble is like chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot. Um, unreliable or untruthful people harm other people. How? What are some of the consequences of untruthful and unreliable people? Um, I, I think for me, I, I guess probably be one of the obvious uh, thoughts is that um, an unreliable person will place their trust. Uh, you, if you place your trust in an unreliable person, you're probably going to end up on the short end of the stick. Or if you believe, again, that, that idea of placing trust in them, if you trust them enough to believe in them, um, to s someone that may not be telling the truth um, will, will cause more difficulty in your life than it will blessing almost every time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's too simplified, but I, I guess no, that's, that's... I, I think that's true. And, you know, it is the whole broken tooth wounded with an axe. I've never been wounded with an axe or <laughs> with a sword or with an arrow, but I have chewed on a broken tooth and walked with a lame foot, and they're painful. Yeah. You can still function. Right. But they're miserable, and... That is my experience with unreliable people. You can still function, but it's miserable. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a lot of work. So verse 20 and 21 says, Singing cheerful songs to a person with a heavy heart is like taking someone's coat in cold weather and pouring vinegar in a wound. If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. Um, 
the this whole practice of timing is is important. Singing cheerful songs at the wrong time, right? Or singing mournful songs at the wrong time. Either one, they both both are a problem. Um, how do you practice timing and what you say or do? Obviously, you know, you, you, working with hospice patients, you know, you can't. Do you find it difficult to always be cheery? Do they want you to be? Now, I think more than anything, they want you to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, but but um, but I, I definitely think that there is a timing issue there. You know, and, and for me, a lot a lot of these proverbs in chapter twenty five are about timing. You know, it's going to the king and go, taking a friend to court. You know, that that realizing the opportune time to deal with these things is 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 as important as dealing with them, you know. Um, and in and, and the passage that you just read, um, singing cheerful songs to a person with a heavy heart, you know, it's, you know, it's about like a slap in the face, you know. It's, it's not... I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's not that the song itself is bad. It's just, you know, you, you have to choose the right time. As far as choosing that right time, I, I think some of that comes through... Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess for me that comes through observation, being willing to um, observe and pay attention to reading other people. You know, as the old saying goes, reading the room. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are just so consumed with their self that they're not very good at reading the room. You know, that, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and so I think timing is all about being able to read the room. You know, okay. um, I, I think that timing is, is um, being able to read the circumstances and then seek the leading of God. I believe, to me, I believe that that the leading of the Spirit is vital in timing, mm -hmm. um, because He sees things I don't see. He knows right. things I don't know. And and there are times, uh, there have been times in my life when I have felt the urging of Him leading that I haven't necessarily thought logically in my mind. This is the best time, or you know. And, and it's, so my response to that is usually, Are you sure, Lord? You're really sure that this is the right time, but I think a lot of it goes back to being able to again read the room, and and also being able to listen to and and um, be sensitive to the leading of the spirit. Yeah, good. So, last verse there says, "A person without self control is like a city with broken down walls." Um, self control is something we've all probably failed at from time to time but the question I, I, I have for you is how can a person improve their self-control mm. um, you know I, I think being intentional about disciplines is a great way to do that um, I, I think a lot of it comes from to be honest with you, I think a lot of self-control comes from desire. You know, really just us wanting to be controlled, to, to control ourselves. Um, but but then beyond that, you know, there, I say that to say that there are a lot of people that would tell you um, they want to be self-controlled, but, but they don't, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it bears out in their attitudes and their actions and their words and the way they, you know, live their life day to day. Um, but if, if they desire, truly desire to be self-controlled, um, I, I think a great place to start is, is in prayer and asking the Lord for help with that. Um, I think another way is to start in small areas that you can work in to be self-controlled. I'll be honest, I, I think some people, um, some people's personality leans to being more disciplined than other people's personality. Right. So, uh, you know, I don't think we all start from the same baseline. But I, I believe that everybody, uh, if they sincerely pray and ask help in that, then they can start in small ways to work on self-discipline. Um, if it's nothing more than what time they wake up in the morning or the routine they go through in the morning, um, I think if they can conquer some of those small things where they establish some self-discipline, some self-imposed intentional self-discipline in their life, 
then that can grow to other areas. But I, I, I believe that, that um, surrendering to the Lord is a big portion of that. Um, again, it, it seems to kind of go back to this, but, but I think the, the wise approach that is talked about through Proverbs is that approach of um, learning to make myself, make Raymond take a back seat and, and say, Lord, uh, help me today to do your will. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Lord, help me to, to put Raymond, you know, uh, second to you and what your desire is. I, I think that's a big, big part of, of self-discipline. Yeah, and sometimes self-control, the number one thing you can do is avoid a situation. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. You know, I, I, I a was, situation that you know you're going to have trouble with. Right, yeah, because yeah. I, I read there's a book that's not a faith-based book. I'm pretty sure it's called... Um, It's a habit. It's a book about habits. But he talks about you only have so much self-control. And a lot of people um, think they can exercise self-control. And you need to save your self-control for situations that it requires self-control. Yeah. And avoid situations. You know, if you, if, you know, if you know you're going to be tempted by something or you're going to be frustrated by something or somebody's going to make you mad and you want to stay, the best thing you can do is just avoid it. Yeah, I agree. And use that self-control in a situation where well, you're going to be required to use it. In that, I think the self-control comes in before you get in that situation. Yeah. You know, I, I, When you were saying that, what it reminded me was of was, I remember sitting in uh, in court with, with our dad. Mm. This was, <laughs> I was 17. <laughs> I'd had a car accident, and uh, first car accident. And... Uh, and he went to court with me. And I have no, I don't know where this came from. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I don't know where this comment came from. <laughs> he was, he was, he was sitting in the courtroom on, on these pews and waiting for court to get started. And dad, you know, would look over and offer pieces of advice here or there. And I guess he was just feeling like sitting in the courtroom watching other people come in and out. This is a good time. I need to I need to straighten this boy out. And I, I remember the setting, and I remember him making this comment because it caught me so off guard when he said it. And and it's not like we had been talking about a topic of girls for 15 or 20 minutes beforehand, but just kind of out of the blue. He said, Raymond, he said, let me give you a piece of advice. I said, okay, yes, sir. He said, um, he said, if you don't want to do something with a girl, he said, uh, don't wait until you're on a lonely road in the back seat to make that decision. It's too late to make that decision. He said, you should, have, he should, you should make that decision before you ever leave your house to go pick them up. And, and, and I've never forgotten that advice. <laughs> but, but I, you know, my response to him was, what are you talking about, Dad? Why, why are you saying this? What you saying? Like, Do you girls, I like guys. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, my just, gosh. Just, I wouldn't have made it out of the courtroom. <laughs> you wouldn't have a brother today. I, uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I was blown away, but it, it sunk into my mind. But, but that's kind of what you're talking about is, is that, you know, there's some things we need to we need to implement self control before we get into the situation. If you yeah. have if you have an issue with drinking, self control doesn't come into the picture when you're sitting at the bar with your friends. Yeah. Self control enters the picture when you're at the house when you're trying to decide whether to go or to go to advice. go out with your friends or not. Yeah. That's right. All right, good. Well, how about closing us up in prayer? Right. Father, thank you so much for today and this time that I get to spend with my brother. Thank you for these words of wisdom that we have to grow from and learn from. I pray, Father, that you would help us, help me to learn from them and grow from them. I pray, Father, that what we say today or do today in some way would encourage or inspire or challenge somebody to live a life that's closer to you, that walks more in accordance to the wisdom that you've made a part of this world and to function all around us. And I believe if we do, we'll bring more glory to you and we'll live more successful lives. In Jesus' name we pray.